<clears throat> so, um, we'll get started here. My name is Brianna Munoz. I am a poet, author, and activist. Um, I wanted to begin by welcoming you all and thanking each one of you for attending our Poets Against uh, 1718 reading and protest. Uh, we have a powerful and packed lineup tonight, so I will open with just a few words. Um, I'll begin by saying that, like many of you, I was watching what was going on in Florida with the current governor passing SB 1718 into law, which, as we know, is an extremely anti-immigrant bill. And, you know, everything that was happening with immigrants fleeing the state and truck drivers refusing to deliver into Florida um, in solidarity with the, Im with the immigrant community there. Uh, I was meditating on how I wanted to react to this. And more than half the time, my reaction to similar issues is to react through or with poetry. So the idea to curate and organize tonight's event came to me um, with a network of really powerful voices, um, this event was created. Uh, I also knew that I wanted to give this event um, a larger platform than it, you know, a lar the, the large platform it deserves. So I reached out to Edward Vidalden at Flower Song Press and asked if he'd be willing to partner with me. He immediately said yes. Um, so a big thank you to Edward and to all of the poets who agreed to participate tonight. Um, Edward at Flower Song Press was going to host. Um, however, I did get um, a message from him just a couple hours ago that um, he had an emergency going on. So I'm not sure if he'll join us later on. Um, but I will be the host for the evening, and um, I just want to send energy his way. I'm not, um, you know, he didn't um, provide any details, but, um, you know, of course, we're thinking about him. So with that, um, I'll begin with our first reader. <clears throat> and... Um, I want to mention that all of the poets tonight um, are, you know, very, um, you know, deserve th their long bios, but because we have 20 people reading tonight, um, we asked for shorter bios. So um, here we go. Uh, Martina Spada has published more than 20 books as a poet, editor, uh, essayist, and translator. His book, Floaters, was winner of the 2021 National Book Award. Other books include uh, Vivas, Vivas to Those Who Have Failed, The Trouble Ball, The Republic of Poetry, and Alabanza. He is the editor of What Saves Us, Poems of Empathy and Outrage in the Age of Trump. He has received the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Shelley Memorial Award, the Robert Creeley Award, and an Academy of American Poets Fellowship, the Penn Rebson Fellowship, and more. Um, so I'll turn it over to Martin. Uh, thank you, Brianna. Um, first of all, I uh, want to make clear that I am not on screen because um thank you everyone for your patience okay thank you everyone um welcome we are um we are live 
And my name is uh, Martin Espada. Um, I am uh, grateful to the organizers of this program, to, uh, to Brianna, to uh, Flower Song, and uh, to all the poets who are present, all the activists who are present uh, this evening, um, coming to you from uh, Western Massachusetts. I'm gonna read one poem. Um, we're already running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna confine it to one poem this evening and I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, and this, uh, this is a poem I wanna to dedicate to the 47,000 migrants in ICE and Border Patrol detention tonight. Uh, June 2019, two Salvadoran migrants, father and daughter, came to Pidona's Oscar and Valeria, drowned crossing Rio Grande. Uh, a photograph of their bodies went viral, sparking outrage, sparking grief, and also sparking skepticism. There was a post in the I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group charging that this photograph was a fake. Um, the following poem speaks to this photograph and to these charges. Floaters takes its title from the term used by uh, many members of the Border Patrol to describe those who drown crossing over. So we begin our program here um, with floaters. And there is an epigraph. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask, have you all ever seen floaters this clean? I'm not trying to be an ass, but I have never seen floaters like this. Could this be another edited photo. We've all seen the Dems and liberal parties do some pretty sick things. Anonymous post, I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group. Like a beer bottle thrown into the river by a boy too drunk to cry. Like the shard of a styrofoam cup drained of coffee, brown is the river. Like the plank of a fishing boat broken in half by the river, the dead float. And the dead have a name. Floaters, say the men of the border patrol, keeping watch all night by the river, hearts pumping coffee as they say the word floaters, soft as a bubble, hard as a shoe, as it nudges the body to see if it breathes, to see if it moans, to see if it sits up and speaks. And the dead of names, a feast day parade of names, names that dress all in red, names that twirl skirts, names that blow whistles, names that shake rattles, names that sing in praise of the saints. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. See how they rise off the tongue, the calling of bird to bird somewhere in the trees above our heads, trilling in the dark heart of the leaves. Say what we know of them, now they are dead. Oscar slapped off a pizza with oven blistered fingers. Daughter Valeria sang, banging a toy guitar. He slipped free of the apron he wore in the blast of the oven, sold the motorcycle he would kick till it sputtered to life, counted off pesos for the journey across the river and the last of his 25 years and the last of her 23 months. There is another name that beats its wings in the heart of the trees. Say, Tanya, Manessa, Avalos, Oscar's wife, and Valeria's mother, the witness, stumbling along the river. Now, their names rise off her tongue. Say, Oscar y Valeria. He swam from Matamoros across to Brownsville. The girl slung around his neck 
stood her in the weeds on the Texas side of the river, swore to return with her mother in hand, turning his back as fathers do later say, I turned around and she was gone. When the time it takes for a bird to hop from branch to branch, Valeria jumped in the river after her father. Maybe he called out her name as he swept her up from the river. Maybe the river drowned out his voice as the water swept them away. Tanya called out the names of the saints, but the saints drowsed in the stupor of birds in the dark, their cages covered with blankets. The men in patrol would never hear their pleas for asylum, watching for floaters, hearts pumping coffee all night on the Texas side of the river. No one, they say had ever seen floaters this clean. Oscar's black shirt yanked up to the armpit, Valeria's arms slung around her father's neck, even after the light left her eyes, both face down in the weeds, back on the Mexican side of the river. Another edited photo. See how her head disappears in his shirt, the waterlogged diaper bunched in her pants, the blue of the blue cans. The radio warned us about the crisis actors we see at one school shooting after another. The man called Oscar will breathe, sit up, speak, tug the black shirt over his head, shower off the mud and shake hands with the photographer. Yet the floaters did not flout on a Rio Grande like Olympians showing off the backstroke nor did their souls float up to Dallas, land of rumored jobs and a president shot in the head as he waved from his motorcade. No bubbles rose from their breath in the mud, light as the iridescent circles of soap that would fascinate a two-year-old. And the dead still have names, names that sing in praise of the saints, names that flower in blossoms of white, a cortege of names dressed all in black, trailing the coffins to the cemetery. Carve their names in headlines and gravestones they would never know in the kitchens of this cacophonous world. Enter their names in the book of names. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. Bury them in a corner of the cemetery named for the sainted archbishop of the poor shot in the heart saying mass bullets bought by the taxes I paid when I worked as a bouncer and fractured my hand 40 years ago and bumper stickers read El Salvador is Spanish for Vietnam. When the last bubble of breath escapes the body, may the men who speak of floaters who have never seen floaters this clean, float through the clouds to the heavens, where they paddle the air as they wait for the saint who flips through the keys on his ring like a drowsy janitor till he fingers the key that turns the lock and shuts the gate on their babble-tongued faces. And they plunge back to earth, a shower of hailstones pelting the river, the Mexican side of the river. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, I, I just feel really lucky that you shared that with us tonight um, in solidarity with, um, uh, you know, the <clears throat> immigrant community in Florida. Thank you. Um, up next, we have Mega Sood. Mega Sood is an award winning Asian American poet, editor, and activist from New Jersey and literary partner with uh, Stanford University. I'll turn it over to you, Mega. Thanks, Brianna, and thanks for arranging this. And uh, it's it's an honor and pleasure to like share this space with so many activist voices. And uh, just before I read the poem, I just wanted to point out the the Senate Bill seventeen eighteen, which is going to be effective into law from July first. It's 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 like 
it's unethical and un-American in so many ways because this country is made of immigrants and that bill is clearly anti-immigrant and not only it's penalizing the immigrants but it's also penalizing the hospitals the employers and anyone who's going to help the immigrants so that's that's just an inhuman way because if we do not have empathy for other people what are we left with right so yeah i stand against the bill and uh, not to take too much time, I'm going to read my poem, Peace, a Metaphor for Denial. Peace, a metaphor for denial. Peace, an act of ignorance, an act of denial, is not bliss, no more. When silence is gutted like a fish and the blood of your own fills the street. How long can you be the puppet in your own peaceful country? This act of abandonment speaks a muted language for all the hearts trapped like sparrows on the other side of town. The wall creates a boundary between me and humanity. They are still considered illegal with one foot in my land and another bloodied and stuck in the barbed wire that I put around God's own country. I was born with the privilege to call this piece of earth my own. No matter it is laced and seeped with someone else's blood, it belongs to me now. The young boy is shot. The pavement is stained and the, by the color of his blood, dark and useless to the people of this peaceful country. Those who pull out the armrest and the beach stairs to see the stars light up the sky and the deafening noise muting the wails of a widowed mother. They sip the beer as cold as their souls, leaving the scene with a shrug and a short sigh. Ignorance is bliss. Peace is a metaphor for denial. In this country, I call mine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mega. I have read that in your book. Um, <clears throat> thank you for sharing. Um, up next, we have uh, Raymond Nat Turner. He is a uh, NYC poet privileged to have read at the Harriet Tubman Centennial Sym Symposium. He is uh, the artistic director of the Stalwart Jazz Poetry Ensemble Upsurge NYC and has appeared at numerous festivals and venues, uh, including the Monterey Jazz Festival and Panafest in Ghana, West Africa. He currently is poet in residence at Black Agenda Report and former chair of the New York chapter of the Na National Writers Union. Um, I'll hand it over to Raymond. Uh, thank you, Brianna, in this one for organizing this whole thing. Um, really appreciate what you've done, your activism and your poetry. And um, it's a pr uh, privilege and pleasure to be on with uh, Mega Sood again. Uh, last time I saw her was at uh, Hoboken, and uh, last time I was on with uh, Martina Spada was at the Left Forum, so it's great to see them again. Um, this poem that I'm doing is called uh, a Governor Woke Smokes Scampaign, singing Dr. Goebbels' greatest hits. Governor Woke Smoke croons intentionally loud. Serving silent 1% pickpockets, working the crowd. Right to work, low wage state where woke goes to die. Homeless in poor health, living Goebbels' big lie. Scampaign funding from riches most rightest directions. For selection, suppression, fueling fascist insurrections. Mishandling migrants. Homelessness and demon hurricane. He's Florida's Fuhrer, branded boss to eat with brains. Slashing social services while leaving low wealth stripes. 
He's a fox box groomer of anti-capitalist white gripes, reclanning, book banning, whitewashing, Nazification. He's the Sunshine State's shrill special operation. His disguise defund the People's Act gifts who it robs with wage thievery called dead-end non-union jobs. Knowing how fat cat rain ends minus the race card, he's weaponized against our numbers, no holes barred. Harvard, Yale, pedigree, woke smokes more clever than George Wallace's white supremacy forever. He's tasked with turning back clocks on blood won games. So that's why he's the boss tweet with brains. Sparing white feelings, floggings, lynchings, castrations, not teaching of enslaving Africans, killing First Nations. Land that forbids teaching of land theft, bloody chains. A white boycott magnet called Boss Tweet with Brains. Culture warring, woke smoke, wedge driving, totalitarian, aping white nationalist, fascist, Hungarian, authoritarian, while crooning next for missiles, bombs, drones, planes. He's 1% prefer this boss tweet with brains. Thank you. Thank you and happy birthday. <laughs> Everyone can wish Raymond a happy birthday. It's today. Um, so moving on, we have Jessica Wilson. Cardenas or Jessica Wilson. Um, she is the founder and executive director of the LA Poet Society and the author of Serious Longing published by Swan World Press. I'll hand it over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much. Um, let's out. Hi. Thank you for having me, Brianna, and thank you for organizing this protest, this reading of Solidarity Against SB 1718. And also wanna wish everyone happy Pride. <laughs> all right. And, and thank you also for accommodating, um, accommodating me into the read. All right, uh, currently no title. Well, actually, no, I'm gonna call this Pangea. <laughs> Pangea. Before the drift, the land linked together like a calm hand, up in prayer to creator that beamed light from beyond the rays, beyond the place where atmosphere meets the freshness of our air. Before the drift, the land was there for all living beings to dig in, build shelters, eat, seek out likeness, in other beings that belonged, that bled, that came to be on the round rock of Turtle Island. Beyond this drift, lives bled away from unity. The drift rearranged us in a procession of ornamental authority, the falsehood that meant we could set aside place for you, and me, and they, and she, and it, and them, and everything made into other. This otherness led some to drift, to distaste, hate, less than tolerant of other ways. For there are other ways to breathe, to prepare bed, to season food, to make love, to exist, one, one amongst the other. But to be led to distaste, 
where such groups create bars around us, keep us in cages, separate us from opportunities to exist, to reach out to each other in our common humanity is a disgusting notion only to sweep all up for themselves under their own rug, their own capital, their own luxury, their own selfishness to be other. There is no limit to that madness. Yet we are here to bear witness and to be a force to regain, to regain that unity. So all hands lean together and once again embrace one another in common humanity. Thank you. Oh, Matteo, thank you, Jessica. That was, that felt really healing right now. Uh, next, we have Cesar L. de Leon. Uh, Cesar is the author of Speaking with Grackles by Soapberry Trees. I love that book. Uh, published by Flower Song Press. Uh, born in Monterrey, Mo Monterrey, Nuevo Leon, he now lives and works as an educator in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Brianna, and thank you everybody for for being uh, being here today and sharing your beautiful words. Uh, I feel extremely honored to be uh, to be a part of this. Um, I will be reading um, a poem titled uh, "A Little Browner," and it is uh, it is part of my part of my book. Uh, just a, a quick. Uh, Quick word on this poem. Uh, it, it came about as Brianna said earlier. You know, we kind of respond as poets. I think uh, one of our responses is to write about things that bother us, right? Or maybe that we want to see changed or fixed. Uh, this this poem came about uh, after I I read uh, something a writer said uh, along the lines of. Uh, her book would have been better received if she had been a little browner. Um, and uh, yeah, so it just got me thinking of how uh, we are commodified. We internalize a lot of this through generations. We internalize a lot of this uh, hatred that is being, uh, you know, taught to us uh, from a young age, um, a little browner. One, when she was 10, my cousin brushed her forearms and neck with a thick paste advertised to turn her skin a shade lighter. All it did was bleach her forearm hairs, made, her, made them shine like corn silk in the sun, like Farrah Fawcett's feathered bangs, who she adored on Charlie's Angels but not in the magazines that made her look too tan, too coppery, too brown like her. How I wish I had told her how beautiful she was to me. How I wish I had known the beauty of her brown. Two, at 14, I helped grandpa fix our roof spent weeks under the Texas sun in June. I was beautiful, lean and young until my resident alien card arrived. The first one with a photo, which I hid from my mother, buried it at the bottom of a drawer. Too brown, I was too brown. Prieto, a cockroach my white Mexican grandmother would surely say. And this is why you need to marry a white girl. Improve the race, my uncle would advise. And every day I pray to the blue-eyed Jesus framed in mother's room. Lord, I don't ask for much. I don't ask to be a widow. Thank you. 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 Th
just make me a little lighter before school starts. Three. Oh, how they love to render us as a sea of brown. Plot and I hear a tooth there like a tropical getaway, like a recipe on Pinterest, cinnamon skin, copper skin, toasted skin, almond shaped eyes, chocolate lips, irises like coffee beans. The wholeness of our faces lost in the frothing fog of their imagination, expiring under their dirt and broken horizons, under their paintbrushes, their keyboards, their pens. How would they imagine us for themselves today? In the fields or the streets? Oh, how they love to save us from us, teach us to be supple, to stoop, to wear our father's boots, to follow our mother's bleach burned voices. Don't stir the pot, turn the other cheek, walk away, be the bigger person and stay out of the sun. And oh, how good it feels to finally say basta. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for, for your words and your poetry. <laughs> um, let's see. Up next, we had Odilia Galvan Rodriguez, but um, I don't see her on. We'll see if she logs on a little bit later. Um, so we'll move on to Michelle Otero. Michelle Otero served as Albuquerque Poet Laureate from 2018 to 2020, and is the author of three books, including Malinche's Daughter, Bosque, Poems, and Vessels, um, which just came out by Flower Song Press as well. Um, and just a quick note to all the poets, we are um, doing good on time, so feel free, you know, don't feel like you're being rushed. Thank you, Brianna. Um, thank you, Flower Song Press, for hosting this. Um, thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm going to share um, kind of a prose poetry piece that I wrote called Quinto Sol. And um, I wrote it inspired by the landscape where I live. Um, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but I grew up um, about 30 miles north of the US-Mexico border um, in a colonized landscape. This is called Quinto Sol. And the epigraph reads, all grants of land made by the Mexican government shall be respected as valid. This is from Article 10, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed by representatives of Mexican and US governments in February 1848, stricken from the treaty ratified by the US Congress in May 1848. Our people were kings, your father would whisper after handing over the day's corn and chile verde to a lagartijo, a man with one polished star to hold up his pants and another to cover his heart. A man whose boots were never dusty, even when he sat at a table in the fields, a scale behind him, the harvest stepped in burlap beside him, a ledger open before him, the curandera holding an umbrella over him, a man with thick hands and skin so clear you could almost see his blood run. It made him seem more real, more alive somehow than you, your father, or any of the Mexicans on the new border. Now you must ask permission to pull chile verde or tomatoes from the vines. So many for them. Sometimes there is enough for you. El Lagartijo's doctor opens your father's mouth, tapping his teeth with the silver spike, the way your father once inspected horses. This one can work, he says. One day the curandera is gone. Before Lagartijo and his doctor, the people paid her to heal. She was the first to hold you as the afterbirth and too much blood gushed from between your mother's legs. Your father gave her the calf he'd smoked in a desert pit, eggs to cleanse your blood and spirit, rosemary to sweep away el susto, susto, a fright so great it sends the soul into hiding. Now the calves belong to the company, a mine, a railroad, a ranch. 
The eggs and even the herbs belong to the town, which is just another name for mine or railroad or ranch. You imagine the curandera becomes wind. El lagartijo will take you one night. His boys will take your daughters. You are property here. This one can work. They make your father sign a parchment littered with the language he can't read. And the next day they come to collect. You learn a new phrase that day, water rights. You never knew a man could own what so clearly belongs to the earth. You will sign with an X the only letter you write, the same in either language on either side. Now there are sides, us, them, and you don't know which you are. Up, down, here, there. They will come up here from down there. They won't stop, no matter how many fences, how many rangers tracking them through crosshairs, how hot the sun that spirits of dead mothers blow across the sky. No matter how strong La Migra, how many signs on this side reading no dogs or Mexicans allowed. They will come. You bury your father on the plot set aside for you people. Mark his grave with an agate you place face down and lift only in those silent moments when you whisper to him, squatting on what must be his feet. Tracing your dark finger along concentric bands of color, you imagine a heart cracked open must look the same. Our people were kings. You will forget that your people built Paquimé and Tenochtitlan. You will never climb the steps leading to the moon at Teotihuacan. Your children will learn half of two languages, and that will never equal one. This new country will hand them uniforms, soldier, miner, waitress, mechanic. Their names stitched in red over their hearts. Your children will wander across these lands, thirsting beneath the fifth sun. Thank you. Wow, thank you. I got chills. <laughs> um, my, your, uh, Michelle's book, uh, my partner just finished Vessels, reading it, so now it's my turn to read her book. <laughs> um, moving on to Trini Rodriguez. Um, Trini Rodriguez, aka Bless of Thilk, has been uh, active her, her adult, all of her adult life. She writes, speaks, and holds space in prayer for healing and systemic social change. I'll uh, hand it over to you, Trini. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. I'm glad to have this I was inspired by um, a scene that I saw. I was outside Home Depot, and we all know that people who are, who are desperate for jobs are they'll they'll hang out there and see what comes up. And um, it it was just a devastating sight what I saw, and it's so common. Um, but as a daughter of immigrants, I saw in the men, my father, my brothers, you know, so many people. Who are who are just uh, left to see what they can figure out to to make a day's work, and um, but I think that one of the things that that um, SB um, one seventeen eighteen brings up is that the the question of work is so central to our being able to survive in this society, and it it just strikes at the heart of of something so central that we can't be silent. And so um, with that, I just wanted to say too, that just like we can, we can see these things, we can also dream because we're the ones that weave our future. And so I'm really glad to see that we are, are part of it. So this, this um, poem is called Grown Men. Stopped at a signal on a street outside of Home Depot. I spot a flurry of men, grown men, the size of my tios, the weight of my father, the color of everyone's brother. They rush, one, then another, then all, running, their sneakered feet quickly alight on a truck, a swarm of bees surrounding a honeycomb of hope, desperate for dignity. My heart breaks at this sight. Grown men reduced to mobbing a vehicle, their ticket to money for the day, if they're lucky. A dream turned to nightmare, pushing all up against the wall. A once proud and able people, authorities of our own lives. Now we respond to the whim of payers, 
ready to spend us like so many prostitutes, all in the name of a day's work. This vision needs to end, this parade of souls in sorrow, this display of aching hearts, begging for a chance to be men, all worth their, their salt, ready to put hands on any task. So yes, our aim shifts and widens in a knowing growing deeper. We are 99% in a world off kilter, more than flies drawn to sugar, more than this constant running, more than fears driving men to cars. Thank you, Trini. Um, up next, we have Teresa May Chuck. Um, Teresa May Chuck was born in Saigon, Vietnam, and fled her Vietnamese homeland on a refugee boat with her mother and brother shortly after the American War in Vietnam. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you for organizing this reading. So the poem I'm going to read is about my experience and my family's experience as refugees. We spent three and a half months on a boat, but this poem is also for all refugees and their humanity. <clears throat> the poem is titled Guan um, on a Dragon. Guan, um, is the Bodhisattva of Compassion, also known as Gunyam Pulsat and Avalokitesvara. Guan Am on a Dragon. Mother shows me a lacquered painting on a plaque of Guan Am, Bodhisattva of Compassion, riding a dragon. It is misty around the Bodhisattva and the dragon. The picture looks so real, almost like a photo, a sacred vase in one hand and a willow branch in the other to bless devotees with the divine nectar of life. Mother says that she and other boat refugees saw Guan Um as we were fleeing Vietnam after the war in a freight boat with 2,450 refugees. When she looked up towards heaven in the clouds, she saw the Bodhisattva in her white flowing robe, riding a dragon. Mother says that the goddess was there to guide and save us from the strong waves of the South China Sea. I should know better than to believe her, though she swears it's true. I ask again, and she nods, says, really, I saw Guan Am in the clouds as we were escaping. I should know better than to believe her, but a part of me wants to believe in a bodhisattva, in compassion riding on a mythical creature, to believe that somehow something more than just our mere human selves wanted us to live. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I also have her book and um, it's beautiful and powerful. <clears throat> um, so up next we have Louisette Resto. Louisette Resto is an award-winning poet, a mother, of three revolutionary humans, a Wonder Woman fan, and a middle school English teacher. She was born in Alas Buenas, Puerto Rico, but proudly raised in the Bronx. She is a Canto Mundo and Macondo Fellow and a Pushcart Prize nominee. Her third poetry collection, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps, was published by Flower Song Press and I believe won an award. <laughs> um, she lives in the San Gabriel Valley. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Um, it, it is an honor to be part of this lineup. Um, it's good to read with 
uh, my mentor, uh, my professor, Martin Espada, um, who started this. Uh, he and I go back at this point over 20 something years. So I was a young graduate student when I walked into his classroom many, many years ago. So it's really cool to be reading with, uh, with him again. Um, and all of you too, and it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so my poem is from the second collection, um, Ascension from Teatricha Press, and the title is called No More Tacos in Gwinnett County, July 2006. And it stems from an actual um, uh, newspaper or news article that I read that came on my feed and it said death to the taco stand. And so I immediately clicked on it because I was like, well, this is an interesting title, Death to the Taco Stand. And then I read it. And in Gwinnett County, Georgia, in 2006, okay, 17 years ago, we were having this conversation even then. They firmly believed that if they got rid of the taco stands, that all the Mexicans would leave Gwinnett County. I know. I know, Trini. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> I saw your face. But this was the belief. They believed that if they got rid of uh, the taco stands and their immigration, the Mexican immigration problem would be over. And that was absolutely ludicrous. And so that stayed with me, which then led me to do more reading. And um, the poem has references to other places that actually um, that connects food with immigration, such as um, in Philadelphia, there is, I think it's Gino's, uh, Gino's uh, Philly cheesesteak there is a sign that was there for many, many years until just recently that says, uh, we're in America, speak English. So again, if you went to order your Philly cheesesteak, they basically said that was one of the, that was literally the sign right there by the, the, the window. Also in Butler County, uh, Ohio, they had a sign at the jail that said illegal aliens here. And so this was in 2006. And so here we are 17 years later um, and still having these conversations and still um, displacing and treating immigrants vital to our communities as second class citizens, third class citizens even. So this is called No More Tacos in Quinta County, July 2006. When the last brown footsteps walked out of Garfield High School for the second time, Quinta County, Georgia declared death to the taco stand. No more dollar corn tortillas satiating the appetites of housekeepers, gardeners, waiters, peach pickers, janitors, nannies, giving them all a five-minute taste of Juarez. The tacos migrated to Philadelphia with hopes of finding a friendlier and hungrier crowd. Instead, they found picket lines with Philly cheesesteaks holding signs. A sub owner had followed Georgia with a sign of his own. This is America when ordering speak, speak English. In the kitchen, Manuel and Juan diced peppers and onions in silence. Paranoia and sign making spread to the Midwest where a Butler County, Ohio jail had a sign pointed to it, illegal aliens here. The steel bars shivered because hunger for revolution and absolution only existed here. Gracias. Thank you, Louisa. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Up next, we have Juan Cardenas. Juan Cardenas is a Chicano beat poet, flutist, and author of The Bee of an Immigrant Chicano, published by Swan World Press. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for including me and and uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, you know fighting for for you know for our people um the how this fan side the greener side of the hill is gated the greener side of the hill is fenced the greener side of the hill has armed guards the greener side of the hill has snipers the greener side of the hill has secrets. This fence side with pulsating hearts, widened pupils, the sun radiating off their batch, slumber of the idea of peace, sleep through the night, teeth clenching and prayer to a rage. Fingers hold tight their clock in a sick love, leash 
around their neck, they bark in pain. Their eyes whipped, ignorant, they gallop. Tongue bought by benefits, dressed in anonymous shame. Country, you're inflicting addiction. It's going to get you killed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Juan. Um, I, you know, when I was putting together the lineup for tonight, I um, was thinking of just each and every one of you. Like Juan, Juan's book is incredible and really follows his story about his, you know, migration story to the U.S. when he was a child, um, and the rest of the poets tonight, and also just. I keep saying I have your book and it's great because it really, you know, <laughs> there's uh, such powerful voices on tonight. Um, I also wanted to, I didn't mention this earlier, uh, but now that we, we kind of have made up some time, um, today, June 1st, is also host to a nationwide community-led labor strike. Um, calling for no work, no purchases and protests all throughout the country in solidarity with the indigenous and immigrant community. So um, today's date for this reading was very intentional um, to stand in solidarity, in solidarity with those, um, with that labor strike. Um, up next, we have Estela Victoria Cordero. Estella is a married mama of four, author of Lutzi Butchley, and a dental hygienist who believes that as, as a child of immigrants, we need to remember that our ancestors came from searching for a better life and, and must respect the desire for others to do the same. I'll hand it over to you, Estella. Thank you, Brianna, and um, I'm very honored to be here with all of you. Um, I think our hearts are connected by the same topic, and I think um, it's a it's a necessary thing. And um, I'm just um, it just makes me think over and over. You know, when is it going to end? And it feels like waves of us going against whatever evil is out there and um and that's why i'm here because i feel like i'm part of this wave that's never ending we have to stay together and powerful in our voices um and so i'm honored to be here with you because even if i don't know you all personally um you know i feel that i'm connected to you in this manner um my parents were immigrants. I was born here, but it, it doesn't, you know, matter. I'm, I still feel my my hand in me, and my my blood is still, you know, uh, native, and that's how it feels because I reject um, anything that's negative. So, here's a poem I wrote um, recently because I, I felt that this gentleman, I call him gentleman in a nice way. I can call him something else in the poem. Um, has just put such a spotlight on um, our people. And I want it to be a spotlight that's a good one, but he's put his spotlight on himself as a person that's full of evil. And I just feel like I had to write this poem about the evil that he is. Okay. So I'm still titling, I'm giving the title to our people, but it's called El Gentillo in the Spotlight. A global disgrace has now shown bright. Seen from a satellite, it shines with pride. You've earned the medal of draconian measures to hate upon our gentio necessitado. The swarm of humanity, hungry, tired, and poor that they are to welcome, they are to be welcomed with a statue dressed in green metal, but you turn your back on this. The truth is, Mr. Dictator, that you see people who don't look, talk, and act like you, and it repulses you. You were taught to hate. No, it's not like your mama said, hate that person. It happened slowly. When your innocent three-year-old smile was replaced with condescending looks, several years after that, when you grew watching your own parents do the same, and love was the reason to carry it in your veins. 
It felt good to be superior, to feel like the empowered one at the expense of anyone who was not as seemingly smug. So this quiet evil invaded your heart, dressed as a sheep. You kept it there until you needed its power. You grew to be used to this. Now what has happened is that you quiet down the rest of your racist followers, the ones who don't know any better with your stupid oppressive laws, with your stupid desire for attention and your stupid idea that teens in the US will get on their hands and knees and pick the romaine that you eat, hammer the two by twos in the hot Florida sun, mow the lawns on your slave built estates, turn the beds you sleep on and when they are good and ready, they subsequently will go to college, improve their education when they can, become teachers, professionals, doctors and lawyers, will hover over your pitiful, unnecessary anger. The truth is, you believe that your blood is privileged. It is the sword to carry the badge of honor. You hate those who are life of the ground, who can grow trees from a seed. And what did you grow? Seeds of hate. May you understand that your narcissistic laws will eventually bite you in the ass. It will come back to haunt you as our gentil, our people who seek nothing but to eat by working the job that your children refuse will be back to laugh at the fact that your, what matters to you, your bottom line will feel our absence and royal in its existence until you see that we are all needed here at some point in our lives. The United States of immigrants, that's who we are. The life of this ground, our gente gentil. We are also the seeds of these brave people who come to survive and give. We must be grateful for once. What a powerful response poem uh, to this current issue. Thank you, Estela. <clears throat> Up next, we have Ivan Salinas. Ivan is an undocumented poet, zine maker, and events coordinator based in the 818. He immigrated from Ciudad de Mexico when he was 10 years old. Uh, thank you for being here, Ivan. Thank you, Brianna. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be sharing space with you all. Um, I wanted to read a piece um, in light of this um, new bill that has been um, gone into effect in, in Florida. Um, this poem is, is dedicated to uh, immigrants like myself. Um, to all those still on the border waiting for some glimpse of hope to cross, uh, reunite with their families, wanting a better life. Um, and the poem is in Spanish and just wanna say a few words in Spanish as well, but um, uh, lo, lo, más que, lo, lo más que puedo decir a la gente que, que sea indocumentada um, es que no hay que tener miedo uh, porque el que seamos tratados como una minoría, uh, que se nos diga que somos una minoría es un mito completamente y uh, nosotros tenemos poder y uh, somos más uh, del, de las personas que nos dicen que, que no es cierto, que uh, nos tratan de, de oprimir y oprimir nuestras libertades y nuestras oportunidades. Um, so this poem is called Ambos Nogales and uh, it's a poem about um, my own experience crossing the border and this being the second time, the second attempt of uh, crossing after being in a detention center for a week or so. Ambos nogales. A media madrugada, el olor a fruta me despierta dentro de un camión. Tierra redada, de vuelta a la frontera. Fresas y plátanos, galletas y jugo de uva. La migra maneja en la madrugada como si fueran coyotes también. Nos dejan hasta cierto punto. El resto nos toca a nosotros. A la orilla de la línea, las trocas de los gringos nos acercan. A la orilla de la línea nos hacen caminar. 
y miran a nuestras espaldas desaparecer fuera de sus luces. Flotamos con la frente en alto, porque si volteamos, nos disparan. Las memorias hechas dentro de camiones llenos de malportados, en autopistas bajo cielos morados. Este, este no es el mismo coyote detrás del volante. Ellos se lo quedaron. Quizás hasta lo congelaron o lo convirtieron en memoria, en gringo, en pregunta como signo interrogativo suspendido desde la rama de un árbol, ya lo dejarán volar pronto. Primero Dios. Dos. Me despierta el olor de concreto húmedo bajo mis tenis y los jadeos de todos acercándose en la línea. ¿A dónde nos devuelven los cordones de los tenis? Porque no tenemos derecho a fugarnos de muerte. Nos echan a los alacranes, a donde ya no nos dicen qué hacer, pero todos hacemos lo mismo. Encontramos un desayuno, un teléfono, papel, cama, lleno de chinches o no, llama a la familia. Y todos dicen, duerme, reza, que mañana envían pesos y dólares. Desde ambos valles. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, so just a, a reminder to the poets, we are doing really good on time. So um, again, don't feel rushed through your sets. Uh, up next, we have Ignacio Carvajal. Ignacio is the author of the chapbooks Plegarias and, and Allow a Litany. They love riding bikes and are honored to be here today. Um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to name my gratitude for everybody who is in this space with us, for the organizers to putting this together, and for everybody who has read. I value your words. I'm here with my friend Dorian and we're gonna share an excerpt from uh, my poem, Allow. Allow the rain to come down, allow the tempest, allow the whirlwinds of the world, allow the poor to elbow and knuckle bleed on the teeth of the barons, of the counts, of the presidents. Allow them to pick out their gold fillings, to melt their silver watches down for new bullets. Allow the policeman's baton to be a pendulum and break his bones upon returning from his war arc. Allow for the clamor bubbling up like a burning swamp to boil out of the marshes and chomp down crocodile-like on the legs of those who live in the tired percussion of their pistons and smoke in the paperback cover love story of the world who choose to forget that the street pulses with spirit. Allow the sun to climb the night ladder and to settle directly above the prophet's forehead. Allow him to wander the streets shirtless and afraid and receive from his fellow humans no beers and no pennies. Allow the prophet to die crucified and hung upside down in the middle of Times Square or from a tiny crack on the Washington Memorial. Allow his horrid nation to lay his neck down upon the railroad tracks. Allow him to be born again and again and again. Allow him to be killed over and over, skinned and uh, skinned and tried, posthumously condemned for having known too much and even said some. Allow his name never to enter into the history books, but instead be handed down by the angry packs in every city in America, like a short fused piece of dynamite, like a plegaria. Allow his words to remain unfucked and untaken. Allow the wretched of the earth to meet him, to sit with him on the benches lining the Mississippi, to wave like flags in the Colorado night, to dry under the sun in Vegas, and to wonder with him the streets broke and concerned only with some too far gone aesthetic understanding of what's true and beautiful. Allow the discontent to with him light fires to the straw man, to welcome the crows with their open beaks and their cawing. Allow the Kansas to overflow and sweep outward. Allow the prophet to build a raft out of Yosemite tall trees and have the decency to pick no one out of the waters. Allow our friends to live near us or visit or call. 
or right, aunque sea, allows to remember their names and flaws, their joys and triumphs, their addresses and contradictions, allow their breaking suffering to be a moving shadow, cast by a flag will burn, unpledge alliance, allow us to pledge only unto those who toil with the sincerity and light of the damned and knowing, with mugre under their fingernails, with calamity wrapped around their limbs, with the crushing hate of the world upon their shoulders, allow us to find them baking on the Texas limestone, wiring circuit in Kansas City, picking up the phone in Topeka, lighting new fires in Tecumseh, loving as they will on the Red River, ascending to the top of the White Mountains, speaking still in Forest County, choosing words carefully in Milwaukee, tending to the flowers in Torreon, making new life in Pullman, producing tunes in Miami, punching out hard poetry in Hostile City, bent over the books in Boston, strumming guitars in Long Island, drowning in white Kansas, painting portraits and glittering and touching together the right wires and teaching and scribbling and writing in Austin, resting a bat upon their shoulders, zeroing in on possibility, making out of love a series of islands stretching mind and body in champagne, muriéndose in white Kansas, limpiando hospitales, rezando rosario, sacando cuentas, haciendo buen verso y vida en Chepe, buscando ciudades inundadas en Atitlán, elevando el humo y la lengua por todo el altiplano, temblando en alguna cantina de chela, oyendo algún órgano sonar en Oaxaca, desempolvando historia en el desefectuoso, brincando como liebre allá en Tijuana, averiguando la coyuntura en Carolina con elefante papalotes en Los Ángeles, ardiendo con el fuego eterno, ardiendo, rising in white Kansas, rising above it, burning brighter than it knows what to do with. Allow us to find them, allow us to find them, allow us to gift them might and loyalty. Thanks, everybody. Wow. <laughs> That was powerful. Thank you. Um, wow. Um, so we are gonna backtrack a little here. We have um, Gabriela Gutierrez. Y, um, I'm so sorry, I, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. Moose, Moose. Um, Gabriela Gutierrez. E. Moose uh, was a child farm worker and is the daughter of migrant farm workers from Durango, Mexico. She is the author of How Many Indians Can We Be and several other poetry titles. Um, I'll hand it over to you, okay? Yes, thank you so much for all your help and for organizing this. You are just amazing. I'm very grateful to be part of this. Um, and uh, we have, what, 10 minutes? We are uh, doing really good on time. So um, any words you want to say, and uh, you can go ahead and share. OK, thank you. Um, I don't know if you can see me here. This is called Foreign, and it's from How Many Indians Can We Be? ¿Cuántos indios podemos ser? We were not made to be foreign, you say with your eyes, to all the homeless nights and wandering butterflies. Will a pint of blood make you Mexican? We were not made to have our bodies tabulated by numbers in a Hitlerian manner questioned by designated orders, prejudged in a state with arms that distrust measuring by liminal hearts. We were not made to hate or be hated. While lines are drawn on mental maps in our Aztlan, the only territory we know as our own land. The mythic map we were joyfully inscribed into as spirits of the past. Our recent history was given to us a movimiento of civil rights, our Chicano homeland from where we cannot be evicted. We so happen to be the proprietors of the myth. And the second one is, um, 
I wanted to make sure that I read um, Puntadas, which is stitches. And it's about all the, uh, the women that have died. But I also want to say that I am so grateful that we stood up for against um, SB 11, or, or what is it? <laughs> 178, <laughs> 1178, because um, it's inhumane. And what we're doing is we're taking away from people who actually bring our food to the tables. So for anybody who's reading and thinks it's just about Mexicans, it's not. It's about everybody in this country. And it's about uh, fascism. And it's about not allowing people to be treated as human beings. I will read, uh, I couldn't find puntadas, but I will find it. Um, I don't know if to read them. This is a completely bilingual collection. If to read them in English or Spanish or the majority of our uh, audience is in English, right? No? Yeah, wh whatever feels comfortable to you. I mean, um, we, you know, either, either language is good with us. <laughs> I'll read Threshold in English and Puntadas in Spanish. From afar as I sit at the recently built country club with recently falling apart sounds, I look up and I'm looking at a history rewound, children wiping the floors as shoes take away purity because in history, it is the floors that tarnished their health in India. Not yet looking at the walls in my room, in India, their impeccable cleanliness is horizontal. And I know the walls of my country are sullied by slave bracero and women bloods, by urban youth and the chemicals soon to perish. I know 60 million plus Americans dream of a wall as protection and not war, closeness and not distance, comfort and not repudiation. The interstice where most of us exist in our mythic homeland occurs to few. Nepantla is for some only history, is a foreign language, but wait, I know the floors grow vegetables, spiced with the anger of injustice. I know in my country, my mother lost her finger on the broccoli someone consumed unknowingly. Her blood made someone's child grow. She as part of the North America. But they don't know it yet of this North America, but they don't know it yet because they have been unaware of the floors, of the fields, of the growth, of the ajolotes who can grow all their extremities back like ours while feeding others, while cleaning floors, while wiping walls and windows, while growing children, while making clothes, while praying for our children to become ajolotes. And the very small one at the beginning. So this is my story when I went to India and I reflected on indigeneity and colonialism. And um, I started writing this collection in 2011. The first poem is very short, Pescando. Lanza tu red de par en par en tu nuevo paradigma. Que no sea pescado lo que pescas. I'm just looking for puntadas, which are um, when I'm talking about the um, stitches. And of course, the stitches for me on the border are all those women that have been killed and a lot of them buried um, between the two countries. And um, it's important that, that we remember them.
So this is a real, uh, another little short one, intercambio. Cuando luces mi huipil como si llevaras puesto un sari, no es que estemos intercambiando identidades o culturas, simplemente respeto. And it's about respect, which these people do not have in Florida. Um, we are not respecting the people who are feeding us and taking care of our children. And um, we need to make the entire country conscious about this. I hope that we have um, regular readings um, on these themes. Um, I'm still looking for the poem I really wanted to read. Aquí está. Puntadas. Todas las Marías cruzaron al otro mundo, pusieron pie en lo útil de la muerte que les permitió existir solo para volverse un alma con número y sin cara, un montón de cuerpos sin identificación. Y aún así se les hizo hablar con un número para decir, nos hicieron para propagar el amor en el pan tostado de las divisiones, la línea, hechas para situar las heridas de la frontera, para suturar las heridas de la frontera, para surcir el llanto de la tierra, de la edad, de las palabras que no conocen ninguna ley. Sus cuerpos, las puntadas del río grande, bravo, sumando de noche, de norte a sur, sur a norte, el zigzag de la vida, de la muerte intencional, de la no intencionalidad, de las leyes sin ley, negaciones íntimas, reteniendo a los niños, a los ríos como cercas, a los cañones como espaldas, a los cuerpos como injertos de la tierra. Gracias. No sé si se me acabó mi tiempo ya. Thank you, Gabriela. And thank you so much for being here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, up next, we have Soul on Fire. Um, Mauricio Moreno. Um, he is... A first generation Colombian American artist and writer originally from Elizabeth, New Jersey. His first full length poetry collection, Anatomy of a Flame, will be released uh, July next month, uh, 2023, um, through Los Angeles Poet Society Press. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, I'll hand it over to you, Mauricio. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, Flower Song Press. Thank you all for being standing in solidarity um, for this really atrocious bill. Um, before the event, I did some research and read what the actual language of the bill says. And mm -hmm. going through it, it's just, it's really abhorrent the things that they, well, one, they add the bill and say that, you know, they use the term aliens to describe people that don't have, um, you know, legal citizenship or you know illegal status um they continually reinforce this idea that we are not worthy to be here um even going so far as to collecting data from hospitals for people that declare that they are not here legally to be reported back to the governor um the more that i learn about this the, the angrier it becomes to me that we're not humanized they don't see us as people who come here with dreamed in our minds with, with families with goals they see us as statistics as 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 almost as objects so um i just want to applaud everyone tonight who has spoken out with poetry to humanize these experiences that we've lived through through our families through our personal lives through people that we know and the piece that I have is, um, it's for my grandmother who did cross. And it's also for anyone that has crossed uh, into the States. And it's called Señora de la Cruz. She throws her clothes into a duffel bag, sweaters and cotton shirts entangled with torn shoes, hoping the church will give them to someone less fortunate. She shoves leaky water bottles into her knapsack, damp banana leaf tamales, Ballet slipper colored conchas, 
day old tamarind squares, whatever she could muster. She licks her thumb, calloused by sewing machine cuts and hammering nails, and counts all of the vessels that she could scrounge up one last time. She leaves the photographs for last, holding them like keys to secret passages, like the ones that lead back to her childhood. She holds pictures of her newborn son in Sunday mass colors and pictures of Abuelita's toothless grin after dinner, and the picture her father thought she lost. Tengo que cruzar. She speaks this mantra as tears, tears travel down familiar roads, her feet ready to step on unfamiliar sands. She doesn't know if the Chihuahuan desert will engulf her or if La Migra will ask questions with bullets. There's no guarantee that Los Yankees won't greet her with a no vacancy sign, and yet still, she says, tengo que cruzar. She doesn't know if her son will remember her, if she'll see his first steps, hear his first cry, nor does she know if El Coyote will keep his promise, or if Los Lobos won't prostrate themselves over her bones. She touches her forehead, chest, and both shoulders, entrusting her children to her deity as she perforates a line she can't cross. Tengo que cruzar. Thank you all. It's been an honor and a, and a privilege to be here. Thank you. And again, congratulations on your new book. Um, <clears throat> Um, let's see. So we are moving along. We have about uh, 30 minutes left of the program and just three more poets left. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the event that unfortunately, um, Ed Edward Vidaure, uh, publisher of Flower Song Press, he uh, texted me a couple hours before tonight's reading saying that he had an, emer an emergency. So um, uh, he, you know, we miss him and uh, are sending energy to him. And, and he didn't provide any details on what was going on, but we know that um, whatever it was is important. Um, and up next we have Angel Dominguez. Angel is a Latinx poet and artist of Yucatec Maya descent, born in Hollywood and raised in Van Nuys, California by their immigrant family. I'll hand it over to you. Hola a todos. It is an honor to be sharing space with you all. Um, and as a poet uh, and person on this planet, I pull no punches. So I'll just say death to fascism an end to white supremacy. I've got two poems for y'all. Also got a very specific hat here that speaks of very truth. And I'm very grateful to be here with y'all. Thank you to Flower Song. Thank you to Brianna for the invite. Um, deeply honored to be here. Coming to y'all live from unceded Ohlone land of the Owuzwa speaking people here in the Bonnie Dune Mountains of California. And these are from an unpublished manuscript. Um, and these poems are available online. I'll throw a link in there and I'll just read the poems. And this one in particular is after the Braceros, um, which a lot of my family came over through the Bracero program. It's called When They Spray Us with Pesticides. Now there is a porta potty. Now there is a bus with a roof. We're dreaming of resting working nightmares because without the work we'll die. And I thought to myself the other day, I wish someone would pay me to live. We are at the end of a very long dystopian novel that's been happening for a couple thousand years and yet we deserve to be human. It's like they think we don't know that. They being the colonizer, they being the fascists, they being the state. The last poem I'll share is The Last Billionaire Died Today. No one could hear that last breath 
over the sound of everyone eating. Thank you. Thank you, Anhem, for being here tonight. Um, up next, we have David A. Romero. David A. Romero is the co-founder of El Martillo Press and the author of My Name is Romero, published by Flower Song Press. Uh, thank you, uh, Brianna. Um, you all can't see me because I might be driving right now, allegedly. Um, so if I were allegedly driving uh, through LAX airport to uh, try to pick up uh, the co-founder of El Martillo Press, uh, Matt Cedillo, who uh, is either late uh, arriving back from Italy or is at a different airport altogether. Hopefully he is alive and well. But anyways, um, I would be remiss uh, not to join you this evening. Uh, I wanna thank Brianna again for organizing this uh, powerful reading of poetry. It's been my pleasure um, to listen to, uh, get to listen to most of you as I've been driving around in circles and or uh, parked in a nearby parking lot. Um, so anyways, uh, I was going to read something out of, uh, out of my book, but I'll go ahead and uh, recite something from memory, uh, as I am, once again, allegedly uh, driving currently. Uh, so this poem is a story of an undocumented student athlete. It's based on the true story of Isaac Barrera, an undocu-queer uh, activist who was uh, affiliated with the Immigrant Youth Coalition. Uh, this poem is called Undocumented Football. When life throws everything at you, don't drop the ball. Don't drop the ball. Blue, 42, set, hike. A brown quarterback's fingers tighten around the white laces of a football. Roosevelt versus Garfield, they meet today upon an annual battleground where local legends spell rivalry in defensive and offensive formations. Upon this old field, in this dirty stadium, football sounds a lot like Boyle Heights, like East L. Lay like years of pride in history. Sounds like Roosevelt is in motion. Number 42, Miguel is with him, crossing the line of scrimmage, clad in red, red and yellow. His muscles tell a story. Miguel has always been running, running from La Migra, Las Placas, everyone who wants to stop him, ask him, Donde están los papeles? Where are your papers? Miguel's too fast though. How fast? Too fast. Too fast for borders, laws, checkpoints, dogs. Too fast for fences, ditches, detention centers, and walls. Definitely too fast for the fool. Unfortunate enough to be Ding up on him now through it all. Under the glare of stadium lights, past the cheering, booing, chanting, and screaming through a maze of players like a beam of holy light, Miguel's vision is clear. He loves this game. It gives him focus, gave him purpose. Miguel will be defined by this moment. He knows this. No college will recruit him. His record doesn't really scream draft pick, but that's not the issue. Miguel never cared for politics. He just loved his coach, his team, his American game of football, his dream. To make a catch in the only important game that he could. Miguel will not score the winning touchdown. This game will be added to a losing record that will make for a losing season. There are so many reasons for Miguel to drop the ball. Walk out of the stadium, just another statistic. Undocumented student, faceless immigrant. There are so many reasons for Miguel to drop the ball. So as it spirals towards him, carrying the weight of a future unfathomable, he repeats to himself like a prayer. Don't drop the ball. Don't drop the ball the ball so he catches it like how he catches his diploma like how he catches his degree like how he catches the hand of his high school sweetheart and they cross the threshold of that goal line together he cradles the ball in his arms like his son john first born legal first born free to pursue his dreams and not always be running so damned hard this is just one story from the east la classic roosevelt versus Garfield, just one game from Miguel. 
of undocumented football. All right, and uh, before I go, I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, so one of the most important uh, movements of poetry within the last couple of decades was uh, poets responding to SB 1070. Um, so once again, uh, kudos to Brianna uh, for putting this reading together. Uh, you know, who knows, this very well could uh, end up having the same legacy and, and impact uh, only if we keep fighting, keep organizing, keep performing our poetry and telling our stories. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Uh, I hope you find Matt. Tell him we all said hello. Um, and congratulations, David just announced that his book Diamond Bars 2 will be published by Moontide Press, I believe. I saw that today. Um, but yeah, um, David was speaking on poets responding to SB 1070 which uh, we were supposed to have Odilia Galvan Rodriguez, and I'm not sure she didn't log on, so um, <clears throat> she might have gotten uh, her date mixed up. Um, I'll check in, in with her later, but she was uh, someone that really led, you know, spearheaded that project um, with Francisco Alarcón um, and, you know, a bunch of other amazing poets. Um, I believe Sonia Gutierrez is, um, is uh, the director of Poets Responding today. Um, so yeah, an incredible project. That's also, I, I believe, where I first um, started publishing my poetry. Um, so yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we are at the end tale here. Um, we went through all the poets and I will close with a poem myself. Um, <clears throat> I recently moved from California to New Mexico and, um, you know, it was a big transition for me. I've always lived in Southern California and I was really missing my community. And uh, while my feelings were valid. I, you know, kind of, I was thinking about how silly that felt because of people who leave their countries and, you know, there's situations where they haven't traveled back uh, for 20 plus years to see their family because they would jeopardize, you know, their, their lives. Um, uh, because of a colonial border wall. So um, this is how this poem came about. It's titled, When I Miss California. When I miss California, I think of all who have fled their motherland and of, uh, and of my grandmother, who until this day never learned English. I think of the hummingbird and the monarch butterfly and all other creatures of migration. I think of palm trees and I think of poverty sitting so close to Hancock Park, how this alone is testimony of the way of the USA war machine. How Mother Earth only speaks love even when she's drowning in toxins created by her children. When I miss community, I remember that my ancestors always walk beside me. When I miss California, I visit the river and think of how it spans across the San Juan Mountains of Colorado to the Gulf of Mexico, how it exists as the most powerful protest to borders. When I miss California, I remember that my body is a home in itself, capable of creating sacred breath, that I am centuries of women inside one body, in the way that I existed as an egg inside my mother's ovaries while she inside her mother's womb. When I miss California, I travel to the, to the Sandia Mountains, a pilgrimage from valley to peak and feel a deep reassurance that ultimately I am where I belong. Thank you. Um, 
a, a huge thank you again to everyone for attending tonight and sitting through the two hours of poetry. Um, thank you to all the poets who joined in this effort to protest um, SB 1718, but even you know beyond that, because it's just one bill, and we know that there's so <laughs> much other bullshit going on in this country and further. Um, so just a huge thank you um, from you know the first poet Martina Spada to the last. Um, so thank you. I will um, keep this open for another 15 minutes and we can hang out or you guys can log off. Um, but yeah, gracias. So good. Hey, Trini. <laughs> You, what a what an amazing event you put on! Yeah. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's really I I have to think of you know all the poets because if um it was just me it wouldn't turn out like this. So <laughs> everybody was just fire. Everyone brought their best. It was, so, it was such a great feeling to know we you know we bring our best to the table for something that's greater than ourselves. You know. Mm -hmm.